any questions, uh, anything I need to handle uh, before I get into my presentation. Uh, any questions on your on your presentations? Um, I think we we set a day for starting the presentations. Um, I think, uh, well, let's shoot for two weeks from today to start presentations, and then we'll have one a week. Um, that will, I'm not sure, at some point we may have to have two, two in some weeks. I don't remember exactly how many we had filled out. Um, seemed like had about eight, so I think we can probably, if we start in two weeks, we can just have one a week the rest of the semester, more or less. So, okay. Uh, so uh, we're going to start at the top. So, um, see who has that real quick. Here. Yeah. So we have all the key, all the weeks I've, I've cared about getting presented, looks like they're all filled. It's not on a team. There are two, two chapters that can be, uh, we can add to it. Um, I just don't think they're the most important ones, so I, I eliminated the, uh, the chapters I thought were least interesting, or I think at least one of them I think it's too American oriented, so I, I eliminated that one. But anyway, so if everybody's on a team, we're fine. If somebody's not on a team and needs to start another team, we can do that. Or if somebody's not on a team and wants to join an established team and make four, you know, rather than start being by themselves on a, another team, that's fine too. Just let me know. Um, okay, so any other questions, problems? If not, we'll proceed. Um, so, for about the next um, eight weeks, we'll at least spend some of our time talking about this book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, we, you'll have other videos that you'll be watching uh, that will uh, supplement this. Uh, and, and so, all together during the semester, as I mentioned, we probably um, will talk or you'll have, uh, you know, either videos or we'll discuss or whatever. Uh, at least two dozen different uh, uh, people who have, uh, you know, success strategies to share with us, let me put it that way. Uh, but um, Stephen Covey, as I think I've mentioned before, is, uh, he is his book, Seven Habits, was uh, uh, voted by one organization as one of the top business management books um, ever written. Uh, others, uh, another organization said it was one of the top two or three of the 20th century. Uh, I mean, he's, it's won a lot of awards. When I went to, uh, when I moved to Kazakhstan 11 years ago, uh, it just so happened that he came to Kazakhstan and I had a chance to meet him. Uh, he, uh, uh, there, they, the uh, business people there that uh, paid to participate in his seminar paid $3,000 a piece to uh, uh, participate in his seminar. Uh, he has uh, met uh, with uh, and provided training for presidents and prime ministers and, you know, as high up people as you can imagine, he's, uh, he's been uh, an important uh, figure uh, in in, in the world of success strategies. He, uh, it mentions here in this, uh, we'll play one video here to kind of start off, and it mentions that that one year, his company um, brought in $500 million. So half a billion dollars off of his training, his videos, his CDs, his books, uh, his personal presentations and so forth. Um, he actually died, um, Shortly after I met him, I don't think that was a cause and effect, but anyway, he, uh, 
a couple of years after I met him, I think it was, I don't know, he died uh, in an accident. Um, he was doing what he taught, teaches people to do, and that is try to keep yourself healthy and strong in every way, in mind, body, and spirit. He was out riding his bicycle and he was hit by a car. Uh, so uh, he's no longer with us, but his teachings are with us. So I think I was just not going forward. There we go. So I'm going to uh, actually turn on my turn off my recording. Okay, so um, again, that's kind of an introduction to. Uh, to what he teaches us, uh, does talk uh, actually somewhat about what we'll be studying more next week. Next week we will start with uh, with the first of the principles he teaches, the first of the habits. Um, the uh, uh, David Starr Jordan said, "There is no real excellent is excellence in all the world which can be separated from right living." This is one of the the keys to what Dr. Covey teaches, and that is there have been a lot of books, and in fact, even some of the people that we will, uh, whose videos we will watch, emphasize a very narrow uh, spectrum of, of principles and strategies to succeed. Um, Zig Ziglar, for example, is, is all into um, positive thinking. And, and a, a number of, of people actually that uh, who speak to us through the videos this week will emphasize positive thinking. Now, I don't oppose positive thinking. I've already told you that positive thinking has a more direct correlation with your, with your success in life than your GPA does. Uh, and that's that's proven much more, much stronger correlation. Um, and so is it important? Sure, it's important. It's part of your outlook. It's part of your paradigm in life if you are a positive person and not a negative person. And that's one thing we'll be talking about today is paradigms and principles, uh, because that's what uh, kind of what what Dr. Covey bases is on. But one of so one of the things he found, and it, it was in his doctoral studies that he went back uh, hundreds of years and looked at books from you know looked at hundreds of books uh, that purported to teach people how to succeed uh, in life. Uh, back to one that I read when I was a kid was uh, one of the founding fathers of America, Benjamin Franklin, talked a lot about that. I, I, I think a lot of my early thinking was shaped by Benjamin Franklin. What Covey found was that the earlier writers emphasize what he calls character ethic. Uh, as the key to succeed. And that is you actually change yourself from the inside out. You become a better person, you will be more successful. Whereas later uh, strategies, a lot of later uh, authors were, were, as I was suggesting, only covering some very superficial aspects of your life. And that you know might include enthusiasm. If you, one of the videos I think we watched this week talks about how you can be a successful a, a successful salesperson if you are positive and enthusiastic. Uh, I left it on there because actually that's probably an example of the sort of superficial uh, teachings of, of more modern authors uh, until Dr. Covey came along at least of just saying how to get people to do what you want them to do, basically. Uh, and and that is exactly, in some ways, the wrong thing we want to teach. Uh, that that teaches you how to manipulate people, but not how to be successful by being a better person. And so Dr. Covey uh, kind of revolted from these uh, the latter decades of of instruction of these very this very superficial. Um, strategy and started emphasizing again what he thought was a character ethic that 
you will succeed if you are a better person. And there are principles, he says, principles that we can base that on, principles that every major religion in the world teaches. Uh, and if we do those things, we will uh, be successful, or we'll be more successful. Again, financially, you know, we, we've discussed this already, what is success? And, and each of you has to decide that. But he believes anyway that if you succeed with this superficial, you know, enthusiasm, manipulative sort of uh, approach, that you may be successful financially, but you won't be successful in your family, in your community. Uh, at some point, people will figure out you're a manipulator and they will actually avoid you at that point. Uh, those are not positive relationships uh, that will be maintained. Uh, it is also part of uh, kind of a, a paradigm shift, just a cartoon related to it. Um, anybody know what a paradigm is? Did we discuss, we didn't discuss that last week, did we? I don't think so. What is a paradigm? A paradigm is kind of like a pair of glasses. It's how you see life. And your paradigm uh, may, there are good paradigms and bad, bad paradigms. There are accurate paradigms and inaccurate paradigms. I mentioned, I told you before about my research where I had people try to predict the future. And th they predicted all sorts of different things. You know, they, their, their vision of the future was, was as broad as the range I allowed them. But they were all 70% sure that they were right. Even though the odds of them being right, uh, well, I gave them three options, the odds of them being right was 33%. Because there's no way to know 10 years in advance what the economy is going to do or what international relations is going to do. Too much happens. And if anything, nobody would have predicted that the Soviet Union was going to collapse, which was basically one of the questions, is what will happen to the U.S.-Soviet relations over the next 10 years? get better, get worse, stay the same. I mean, some people may have said it'd get better, and I guess that's the closest to the right answer uh, because almost exactly 10 years after I did my survey, the Soviet Union did not exist. So in a sense, none of the answers were correct. It was gone. Uh, so uh, that would have been the, 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 and that was probably, actually I don't even know what the most answered, I didn't care how they answered, that wasn't the issue. Uh, but if it was going to have been anything, it probably would have been, the majority would have, or the plurality anyway, would have said our relationship with the Soviet Union would have become worse. And indeed, only like th three years after that, the Democrats in America were running ads showing a nuclear bomb going off and saying that Ronald Reagan was going to start World War III. And instead, he ended the Cold War. So there was actually... Uh, if anything, kind of an impetus towards negativity uh, at, at that point. The, uh, this, the paradigms that we have relate to perceiving, understanding, and interpreting. That's what a paradigm does for us. How do we perceive the world? Uh, how do we understand the world? And how do we then interpret the world? But it also then affects how, what do we do about this. If, if, if the way we see the world is, uh, is a certain way, we're going to take action in that direction. Let's take as, as an example, uh, in fact, I think I put it into this uh, PowerPoint, and we'll get to it in a second, but um, in the early days, um, the early astronomers and so forth thought, where was the Earth compared to um, the, the planets originally, what'd they think? In, in all the planets in our solar system, where was the Earth? Anybody know? The, the earlier thinking was that all the planets revolved around us. And in fact, the sun revolved around us. We were the center of the universe. Um, then Copernicus came along he said, no, 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 uh, that's not right. Sun, we revolve around the sun, and the whole universe revolves around the sun. Well, that wasn't right either, but it was more right than the earlier 
uh, theory. It was actually um, took quite a while before we realized the nature of our galaxy. In fact, the word galaxy was not actually created, was not at least, well, it might, it might have existed, but it wasn't used the way we use it today um, until the 1930s. So less than 100 years ago, the astronomers and scientists finally figured out. In fact, in 1920, there was an argument, uh, basically, so almost exactly 100 years ago, there was the argument going on, what are those blurry little things in the far distance? It looks like there's multiple stars close to each other. Um, but they weren't sure what it was. And so one of the top astronomers, I think he won the Nobel Prize for his astronomy uh, from Harvard, said those are kind of like universes. They still called our galaxy a un our universe. So the word galaxy was not used yet. We were the center of the universe, basically. Or, or at that point, they knew that there that we were not the center of the universe. But they they knew that they. I think at that point they knew that we revolved around something in the center of what we now call our galaxy. Galaxy, and that's huge. That's immense. It's a black hole. They think. There's also huge planets and stars towards the center, apparently, because it has to be the gravity has to be strong enough that they're thinking that somewhere between 200 and 400 million billion, excuse me, 200 and 400 billion stars revolve around the center of our galaxy. Billions and billions and billions. It's, it's the, the universe is amazing to think about that. That that and some of the stars are make our sun look like, you know, like scum. I mean, there are stars that that make our planet, our, our star look so tiny in comparison. Um, and planets also, huge planets out there that, that are the, bigger than our, than our star, our sun. Uh, so, um, you know, to think that all that maybe 400 billion stars and additional planets and everything else could be revolving around a center of our galaxy is itself quite amazing. Uh, but that's the extent of what they knew 100 years ago. That was all they thought there was. Uh, they thought those other fuzzy little things, like I said, were maybe some sort of grouping. And so the word they used, uh, we were the universe and they were island universes. Uh, the word again, the word galaxy was not being used yet. And we had no idea that some of those far away island uh, universes were much bigger than us. Some of those other galaxies have a trillion stars in them or more. And so we're tiny compared to them. And so a hundred years ago, they had no clue. And the word galaxy was not even being used in that context until they realized um, that maybe those island university universes were a little bit bigger than they thought and so in the mid or in the early 1930s they did decide we better start calling this stuff galaxies and so they started having a better telescopes and stuff they started getting some idea so that's only like i say that's less than 100 years ago we had some grasp of what the universe was like um, whereas copernicus lived you know, hundreds of years ago. And uh, we didn't learn much after Copernicus until like I said, 90 years ago, 100 years ago. Uh, so as we tried to make sense of our universe, we were basing everything on, you know, untrue, a, 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 a false paradigm. Um, there are all sorts of types of paradigms. Those are paradigms that are caused by religion. Uh, help us see life a certain way because of our religion. Uh, there's a paradigm, if you don't have a religion, you have a different paradigm. It's still a paradigm. Uh, whether it's a true paradigm or, or, or a false paradigm, in some cases, like religions, we may not know till we're all dead, right? Um, I mean, I think I have the true paradigm, but then so do you. <laughs> Whatever your paradigm is, you think you're right. Because uh, that's the nature, as I mentioned from my study, that seems to be the nature of human beings. We're all sure we're right. Uh, we're very comfortable with our paradigm. Um, 
So um, thus we perceive life, perceive life, whether it's scientifically or religiously or socially, we have paradigms that cause us to perceive things, understand things and interpret things in different ways that could be bad or could be good. Uh, Dr. Covey compares uh, paradigms with a map. So suppose you uh, were not from here. Um, let's suppose you were from America, like I am, and uh, you came to Malaysia and you asked somebody for a map. They gave you a map of Singapore, but you were going to Kuala Lumpur. And so you go to KL with your map of Singapore and try to find something there. How much success you're going to have? Not much, right? It's a false paradigm. And so you wander around uh, KL looking for something that you will never find, probably, unless you stop and ask somebody and realize your paradigm is off. Your paradigm is not correct. Now, if you had uh, one of these positive thinking coaches to call up and say, hey, I, I'm, I'm, you know, lost here in KL, your map isn't helping me, uh, they, they might say, work harder, come on, work harder, have a positive think, have a, you know, positive focus on this, you're going to succeed, do it, do it, do it. And so you won't stop and ask anybody. You'll be convinced that you should just work harder, be more positive, be more enthusiastic, and you'll just keep driving around KL uh, for a lot longer. Uh, but you still won't find what you want to find. No matter how positive you are, no matter how hard you work, you have a false paradigm. You're driving around with a map of Singapore. Um, so that is the problem we face with paradigms in our life. Um, and so in a, in looking for success, strategies for success, Dr. Covey wanted to look for the truest paradigms he could find. And so he began looking at, um, I say through hundreds of books from the past. Um, as I said, he kind of felt like ones that were written 200 years ago were more accurate, were more you might say infinite, you might say more based on principles that he felt were forever, that they were truths that we could live by. The, uh, so anyway, a simple way to understand paradigms is to see them as maps. The way you see things is the, is the source of the way we think and the way we act. So basically what I was just explaining. Paradigms are the source of our attitudes and behaviors. We cannot act with integrity outside of them. So if we have a certain uh, way of looking at life, it's what it, what he's, the word integrity means, you know, that we are living true to our understanding. Uh, but the problem is, what if your understanding is wrong? Now that's a problem. So that's where you have a false paradigm and you may be doing stuff, for example, the, the terrorists blowing up people. Is that a true paradigm? I hope not. I don't think so. I think most Muslims uh, don't think that the, that the Muslim terrorists are doing the right thing, but they're out there doing it because they have a, a paradigm that we, most of us here, I hope, would agree is a false paradigm. They're going to get to heaven and have, have all these virgins. They're going to be live happy ever after, after having killed perhaps, you know, in some cases, maybe even thousands of people, they think they're going to be rewarded for it. Um, so whatever your opinion, I, I think that's a false paradigm. Uh, it's not definitely, it's definitely not a way, I don't think, to be happy in this life, to go out trying to kill people um, and so forth. Um, so for this life, it, it seems to be a false, I think most everybody would agree that's not a good paradigm to be happy in this life. Uh, I would hope most of you don't think it's a good paradigm to follow to be happy in the next life. But uh, what can I say? Um, 
Some of you have seen this before. If you have, don't tell anybody. But this is, uh, what are we seeing here? We're a young woman kind of looking in the direction. Um, we look at that for a few seconds, and then I'm going to put up another one, and you're going to tell me what you see in the second drawing. Okay, how many of you see a young woman in this picture? How many of you see the, I say a young woman? Okay, how many people see an old woman in this picture? If you do, you probably have seen this before, but maybe not. Maybe that's the only picture you see. How many can only see the old woman in the picture? Anybody can only see it? Okay, so most of you who, who see this picture see the young woman. Part of the idea of this test is that once you've seen uh, the previous one, oops, uh, that uh, it would make you think of a young woman. And then when you see this one, you'd still see someone who looks a little bit like that. But if you uh, see a different <laughs> Here's an old woman, eye here, nose here, mouth here, chin here. Here's a picture here of an old woman. Uh, some of you may have not seen an old woman because you already have a paradigm of a young woman. You're already seeing the young woman. You can't see the old woman. Uh, but she's there. Again, uh, uh, I pointed out where the eye was at. She's looking more sideways, so you're kind of seeing her profile, whereas the other girl, the young woman, is looking away from you a little bit. But the old woman is looking kind of sideways. Eye, nose, mouth. So how many people can see the old woman now? Can everybody see the old woman? Who cannot see the old woman? There's still some of you who can't see it. Um, that's the way our minds work. That's, that is the point of this is that we get a paradigm caught into our brain and we can't see something else. We don't understand something else. Um, but again, it may take you a while. Uh, but uh, again, when we look in this direction, But again, the nature of a paradigm. When you do, uh, so how many just saw it, you know, had to take a few seconds to see it? How many saw it just today, saw the old woman here? How many of you just recognized that there was an old woman there? Okay. Did you have a feeling of, aha, I see it, right? And that is what they call it, the aha feeling. When we can suddenly understand something new, when we suddenly have a paradigm shift, we have this sense, aha, I see it. Um, and you suddenly see something differently. You may see your whole life differently once you have an aha experience, a paradigm shift. So a paradigm, uh, the power of a paradigm, the aha experience when someone finally sees and understand something they've never seen before. I love having paradigm shifts. I mentioned the other day I like uh, watching videos about uh, quantum physics is to have paradigm shifts. Um, uh, intellectually, that's one of the most fun things uh, to, uh, about being a professor. Let's have a paradigm shift. Oh, boy. Uh, it's kind of exciting to suddenly see life differently, see something differently. Um, so I, enjoy, I love paradigm shifts. I love that aha feeling when I suddenly see something differently. Uh, even if I don't necessarily agree with it, like we talked about, you know, the scientists now, you know, some scientists thinking we are part of a, basically a video game. Um, and they're actually spending, you know, they've convinced people enough that they're spending, you know, more than a million dollars trying to prove that we're not real, which is bizarre. I'm not sure why you want to know we're not real. Let us enjoy our ignorance. 
uh, even if we are somebody's uh, video game, computer game, whatever. Um, but they're serious about it. They are serious about it because uh, they see everything so perfect that it's so mathematical, it is as if somebody programmed everything we're doing. Uh, down to, as I mentioned, even the black hole, that it figures out mathematically, and again, I don't understand how they know this, but the, 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 uh, what do you call it? the, what's the right word for it? Anyway, the, uh, the kind of the outside of it, the, um, is equal to somehow mathematically to what's being sucked into it. Uh, and it's keeping a memory, like it's keeping a memory of everything it's destroying. I mean, that's the theory is, well, we don't really know what a black hole does, frankly. Uh, but the supposition is the that the gravity is so powerful that it somehow that it would have to destroy anything that it sucks in. That it, that it's so powerful it sucks in light. So I mean, if it sucks in light, what else? I mean, what's it going to do to something else? But they're saying they can prove that it's keeping a memory of everything it sucks in. And that's why, you know, that sort of evidence is, is why quantum <laughs> uh, physicists are saying that's too mathematical. That's just, that's beyond, um, you know, an accident. Uh, so, whatever. I don't know. Um, so, again, I'm not going to try to pronounce the first guy. Does anybody know how to pronounce the, the first name? I don't know. I can pronounce Copernicus. But anyway, this is what I was talking about. So the, the first, the original idea from the early astronomers was that uh, Earth was the center of everything. We are it. And then the sun was the center of everything. Um, and of course, now we know both of those are wrong. Uh, just another cartoon that um, Covey became famous enough that basically there, he just became, his ideas became part of American culture, especially, but lots of other cultures too, Western culture for sure. And so even cartoons were being made about paradigm shifts. Seeing and being, what we see is highly interrelated to what we are. Paradigm are paradigms are powerful because they create the lenses through which we see the world. So as I said, it's a, how you understand the world, certainly how you interpret the world, perceive and uh, interpret, um, understand and interpret, but ultimately it's also how you act on the world. Uh, the way you see it determines whether you're going to be a terrorist, for example. I mean, that's built on a paradigm that somebody has, I'm gonna go out and kill people. Um, so they do. So we were talking about then Covey wanting to go find a, a success strategy that was definitive, permanent, eternal, based on truths that that uh, that everybody basically agree could agree on, at least all the major religions and so forth. These are paradigms that most people would say, yes, that's that's a you know a good thing. Whatever religion we represent, whatever, whatever, these are good things. And so these are some of his principles that he thinks are among those that are absolute. Uh, that if we live by these, we will be happier, we will be more successful. Fairness, integrity and honesty, human dignity, service, potential. Um, so, for example, some of these may not be real clear. I think some are rather obvious, uh, but that people uh, do. That it, when it's not talked about human dignity, that, that people have value, that we need to respect that value that everybody has, um, that we are happier and we are more successful if we take a service orientation. There's a strategy called service leadership. That as a leader, it kind of relates to, uh, I mean, I'm sure it's been taught in other religions too, but one of the things that Jesus taught was uh, that you should be last of all and servant of all. Um, so it's kind of that idea that you're a leader by serving other people. 
not by having other people serve you. Uh, and if you're that way, you are more successful and you will ultimately be um, obviously happier if people love you because you're uh, service oriented and you're trying to help them. I mentioned, I guess I didn't mention here, I mentioned another class. For example, as a manager, if you were uh, to bring in your employees uh, every so often, every few months, and say, you know, okay, uh, uh, how are you doing? You, you doing okay here at work? Is there anything that you are concerned about that, that we could address? How about your own life? How are you feel like you're progressing? Uh, do you feel like you're growing, that you're becoming better at what you're doing um, here at work, but in, beyond work? Is there anything we can do to help you uh, become the better you? What can we do? Uh, you know, if you if you were the boss and you were sitting down and, and having this discussion with your employees every so often uh, and sincerely followed up on it, uh, perhaps uh, arrange for them to take some time off uh, during the day uh, to go take a, a course or, or something. You know, if you were if you were actually brainstorming how you could help them be better, happier, more successful, how do you think they would feel towards you? Think they'd like working for you? There's been a study that shows that people don't quit jobs. They quit bosses. That's why they quit. Um, and so if, if they love you, then in many cases, they'll stay with you even if they don't make as much money because they're happy working with you. Um, there is a, uh, a, a, a owner of a chain of hotels in California that kind of based his business on that idea. Uh, and he suggests that, uh, I guess, I think he said Nepal, as a national uh, program based on setting a goal for people to feel happy because they're feeling successful and progressing. Um, and so anyway, this hotel owner, um, you know, really tries to make his, his, all of his employees feel like I was saying, you know, feel progressing and feeling, feeling good. And so uh, their attitude uh, towards their customers is much better. Um, he, he asked, uh, he had a little interview with one of his custodians who basically her job was cleaning toilets and stuff. And, and, but she was always happy. He said, you know, you don't have a great job here yet. <laughs> Why are you always happy? Uh, you, you're just cleaning toilets. And I'm not cleaning toilets. I'm helping customers. I'm helping customers have a good experience here. And so that was what he wanted to permeate his organization. Um, potential, it's important to understand not just human dignity that you are of value, but that you have much more potential than what you are currently uh, exhibiting. We all do. No matter if you have a PhD or whatever, you all have, we all have more potential than what we are exhibiting. Uh, what the potential that is, I think it's tremendous. I, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I'm not going to get into the religious side of my thinking, but on, uh, scientists say that we only use somewhere around 5 to 10% of our brains. What will happen when we can use 100% of our brain? I, th I think there's even, if just taking it from a scientific perspective, I think with the kind of progressive progress we're making and some of the things we're already talking about of how they can embed knowledge into our brain eventually and stuff like that, I think it's very possible that we someday forgetting about divine intervention or anything like that, that we could possibly use 100% of our brain, in which case it could be kind of scary. Because we may have powers we don't know that we maybe are kind of dangerous even. Um, I don't know. But I think just, again, totally out of the religious perspective, we have potential that we really can't even imagine. Um, I mentioned before that uh, the creator of the idea of, of multiple uh, intelligence, I mean, based it on the fact that these children were doing amazing things that adults couldn't do. And so he presumed that somewhere in our brain it has that power so that if they could tap into it, we could all uh, be uh, playing Mozart 
you know, when we're three years old. And we could all be doing calculus when we're four years old. And we could all be doing this other stuff like trials prodigies do that exist in this world. Uh, that it's there. Most of us haven't tapped into some of those things. So, I mean, his point is, is that we should see ourselves and other people as people with amazing potential. Um, and that we can help them achieve their potential and we can change our own, ourselves, in ways that we can't even imagine. Um, Albert Einstein, um, going back to the idea of paradigm, said the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. You know, most of the problems in the world we created. And so to solve them, we can't have the same mindset. We can't have the same paradigm, uh, whether that's, uh, you know, the idea that we need to uh, have nuclear arms to protect ourselves and or whatever it might be. Uh, there are paradigms that are causing us to do things that are not healthy for our society, for our world. Um, so it gets complicated. Dr. Covey then says that contrary to some of these other success strategists uh, that have written books and stuff that we should really be looking at the these eternal principles that he was talking about and we should change ourselves from the inside out we should be the sort of person that people want to work for we should be the sort of people that um, our spouses want, will want to be married to uh, we should be the sort of people that our children will love um, so forth we need to be it, not just pretend to be it. We need to be it from the inside out. And so that's what he has based his seven habits on. Um, so what is a habit? A habit is basically something we do without even thinking about it, right? Um, I've read books that say, suggest at least some habits. They might be fairly simple habits, but some habits you can create in 30 days. Um, I think I did do that with, I have kind of a silly habit. I mean, you might laugh at it, but um, there's a book I really enjoy reading uh, or several books. And so I made a deal with myself that whenever I went into the bathroom, the toilet, I would have that, have those books there and I would at least read one paragraph. That was a promise to myself. Now I never read just one paragraph unless I'm really in a big hurry. So I'm sitting there anyway, uh, and so I read a page or so, maybe more, depending if I get interested. My dad used to call the, our, our bathroom our, his library, and so I guess that's my library too. Um, so it seems like a, it's a silly habit, but it means I've read, done a lot of reading. I'm not just sitting there. I'm doing my reading, um, and it has become a habit, so I don't have to think about it anymore. If, if anything, when I go in there, I, I have to make a conscious decision not to do it because it's my habit. Um, and, and so that conscious decision might be, I've got to be someplace in five minutes, I can't. But it does, that doesn't happen very often because in, I would say within 30 days, I had created that habit. Uh, and it is with me, it's been with me for years. So there's some habits you can create very simply. You just have to do it. You have to, you know, force yourself to do it for 30 days or so, and you have that habit. Some habits are probably a little bit harder than that. Uh, the seven habits um, may be in that case. So they may be harder, first off, to even understand. You need to understand them. You need to, uh, in fact, uh, let me go to the next slide here. So you need to understand them. You need, there. in some cases, you need to build skills for them. Like I couldn't have my habit unless I knew how to read, right? Uh, so uh, there are certain, certain things you have to do. You have to build up skills to actually be able to do them. Uh, so you need to uh, have the knowledge. You need to have the skill. You need to have the desire. And, and, and usually it has to be a pretty big desire for you to, to build that sort of habit. Because even doing it for 30 days, if, that, if you think you can, you know, we can develop a habit in, habit in 30 days, that still means you have to have the desire to do it. You have to force yourself to do it for 30 days. And some habits might be more than 30 days. Uh, so you have to at least exert that much will, and then it's automatic. So 
but knowing that these are a little more complicated, knowledge of them is more complicated, how to do them uh, successfully uh, is why he wrote his book. You know, how do you become more service oriented? How do you be more honest and filled with integrity? How do you uh, pursue uh, greater potential in yourself and in others? Uh, these are these are principles, but he's uh, you know you need to understand not only the principle what it means, but how can I apply it? That takes knowledge. How do I apply this principle in a way that uh, that makes me happier and more successful? Uh, and uh, so it does. It takes more effort, more uh, training, and so forth. But and then ultimately, it takes that desire to, to do it. Dr. Covey says, while you may be able to apply uh, the seven habits to some degree, probably you can't adopt them all at one time. Uh, that's probably humanly impossible. And so don't give up on it because you can't do what probably nobody can do. Uh, work on one habit per month, for example, and work, work really hard on one habit and gradually you'll get better at it. And, uh, and then once you feel like you've accomplished something with that habit, then look at another one. Uh, before I go, go on, I kind of skipped over. I don't have a slide for it, so I skipped over it the other day. Um, he also, it's important because it does relate to the quiz you have. So, uh, hint, hint. Um, he tells a story that he relates to principles. Uh, the nature of principles. And he, he says there was a, and I guess it's based on a true story, um, there was a battleship out in the ocean and uh, there's a great storm came up. They could hardly see anything. And of course the waves were knocking them all over the place. And, and uh, then they saw ahead, they saw a light. And this was before, I guess this was before good radio communications and stuff. It says when they communicated by Morse code with a light. And so uh, when they saw this light in front of them, they, uh, he, the, he said, okay, uh, flash them a message and tell them to turn aside. And so they flashed the message and they got a message flashed back to them, you turn aside. Well, now the admiral on the ship and the battleship was a little bit antagonized by this. He says, uh, he flashed back and tell them, uh, we're a battleship. Uh, no, I think the first one he said, I'm, I'm an admiral. Turn to the side. And uh, then they flashed back. I'm a seaman first class. You turn aside. Now he was mad. He said, we are a battleship. Turn aside. They got flashed back. I'm a lighthouse. Uh, obviously, you know, you can't tell a lighthouse to turn aside. A uh, lighthouse is typically built on, you know, maybe the, uh, like a little, um, what do you call it, a peninsula or whatever, hanging, you know, out in the ocean a little bit. It's out there for one thing to keep ships from running aground. And so that's why you have it uh, spinning around warning everybody, don't come here, you're going to, you know, crash. Um, and so uh, Dr. Covey compares this to a principle that no matter how much we want to fight it, no matter how much we yell and scream at it, whatever, or flash our light at it, you don't change a principle. It's like a law, like a, a law of nature. Um, no matter if Congress if, or the parliament here or whoever passes a law against the law of gravity, they forbid, they outlaw the law of gravity. What's going to happen? Are they, is gravity going to stop? No, gravity's not going to stop, right? And Dr. Covey says the same things with these principles he was talking about earlier. Uh, that these are eternal, you know, you can't fight them. These are truths that you can't fight. Uh, even if you're a battleship. So the seven habits are uh, shown here, uh, along with some other information. So down at the bottom, you see habit one, you mentioned in the video, is be proactive. 
Um, that's probably one of the I can. What does it mean to be proactive? That's one of those words that it existed before Stephen Covey, but um, it had become part of the Western culture for sure. But uh, anybody know what the word proactive means? Anybody? Kind of the opposite of reactive. So what's reactive mean? That's a word you might be more familiar with. So if somebody hits you, you react. What do you do when you react? Somebody hits you in the nose. What are you going to do? You're going to hit them back, right? That's a reaction. Uh, proactive is what they were talking about is there's a split second or a second or there's a period of time there that you can expand where you can say, no, I'm not going to hit them back. Um, and you decide what you are going to do in that split second. Um, one thing he said is that animals are not able to be proactive. But that's one of the main differences between uh, human beings and animals. Is there something in our nature that we are able to resist reaction, if we will? It's still, most people still live by reaction. But they don't have to live by reaction. And so he was talking, uh, giving some examples. Um, some people, he raised that question of, are we the results of, of nurture or nature? In other words, are we DNA or the way our parents raised us, is more or less what he's saying. Um, and his, he said, neither one, if we're proactive. If we are proactive, we make decisions what now, you may have some obstacles. Uh, has anybody seen the, the short movie, uh, The Butterfly Circus, by chance? Uh, I'm going to show it to you in the last day of class. It's one of my favorite, it's only like 20 minutes long. But it's, the, uh, it's a, a movie, a short movie, that made uh, Nick Van Chick, whatever his name is, famous. Uh, you saw, uh, you should have, you were supposed to, I think, the first week watch a video of the guy with no arms and no legs. Okay, he became famous in that movie. Um, I mean, he might have been doing some stuff before that. I'm not, I presume he did. He probably, somebody discovered him and put him in the movie. Uh, but um, certainly since then, uh, he's become very famous. And he, uh, he travels the world giving inspirational talks and, and so forth. Because he uh, he's such a good example of somebody who has overcome the worst of natural circumstances to be born without any, or maybe not the very worst, but pretty darn close to the worst that you can imagine with no arms and no legs. It was discouraging enough that as a child, his, I think the video that you should have already watched said that he tried to kill himself. He could not see that he could be happy in life. Now you may know you. Uh, I I um, kind of subscribe. I think I subscribe to him on Facebook or anyway. I I kind of keep track of him in social media and otherwise. And he's married and he has a couple of kids, two or three kids. Um, very beautiful wife that fell in love with a man who has no arms, no legs. Um, I'd say she must be quite a woman to see past that. Uh, the very beautiful woman, nice, you know, regular, you know, normal kids and everything. That's something he never thought he could do, that he could experience, was to be a husband and father, uh, let alone fairly rich and famous. Um, so he's an example of somebody who had, like I said, some of the very worst of natural circumstances. Uh, in fact, the, the, the Butterfly Circus is all about that. So he may have even been involved in writing it. I don't know. But it, at one point, the circus master, uh, the, the butterfly circus, the circus master uh, basically gets people who other people reject and makes them into circus stars. And so anyway, Nick, his, his character, um, at one point, I won't, don't want to give away the whole story, but anyway, at one point, he's very sad because he can't be part of the circus. And uh, uh, the circus master you know, tells him about everybody else, and, and uh, the, you know, and he says, well, I, I'm not like them. I, I can't 
do this stuff. And he said, uh, no, you're right. You're not like them. You have an advantage because the greater the challenge, the greater the glory. And in a sense, that's true of his life. I mean, wow. Um, an, an incredible person. Um, so uh, being proactive is how we react to whatever. Uh, as he said, you know, there, there are studies that show that people who are abused by their parents will usually abuse their children. But you don't have to. If your parents beat you and kicked you, whatever they did to you, you don't have to do that to your children. You know, being proactive says, no, I can choose what I'm going to, how I'm going to raise my children. I can, I can choose how I'm going to react when the kids cry and yell and scream. I can choose, basically, there's this space between stimulus and reaction that I get to decide what I'm going to do. And so that's his first and maybe one could argue his most important principle that we determine our own destiny because a lot of people in the world don't think that way. A lot of people in the world say that their fate has been sealed because of something, their natural self, their, the way their parents raised them. Um, they want to make excuses for why they can't be what they would like to be because of their circumstances. And he's saying, baloney, you can. And that's the first thing you have to believe. And it relates to potential. The first thing you have to believe is you can change and you can be something much greater than you are now if you put in the effort to do it. Um, now, the other ones, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with them. Uh, some are fairly obvious. Uh, the uh, second habit is begin with the end in mind. Is basically, you know, whatever goal you have, what is it you really want to achieve? Because unless you have that goal in mind, you can't get there. It uh, kind of goes back uh, back to that paradigm of the map. Unless you know where you're going, you're not going to get there. And so uh, beginning with the end in mind is important. Putting first thing first is a management decision. How do I manage my time? We all have 24 hours. Some people do great things with their 24 hours, and some people waste their 24 hours, and they get nothing done. How do I manage my time and my life? So that's the self-management principle, and we'll get to that in, a, in three weeks. Um, and so um, he calls this, you see the little triangle in the center, this is the private victory. If you can develop those three habits, you are moving yourself from dependence to independence. So that's another aspect that we that we need to discuss here. Dependence, when we're born, we're dependent. Well, we can't do anything for ourselves, right? And there's nothing we can, that's not our fault. We're, we're babies. Uh, but over a period of time, we become more independent. But not everybody ever does, not, at least not totally. Some people are forever dependent emotionally, for example. They, they are always dependent on somebody else for their happiness. They believe that. I would be happy if, is what they say. In fact, we may find ourselves saying that. I would be happy if. That is a false, that is a statement, probably a false statement. Uh, because if you're not happy now, you probably won't be happy if, whatever that if is. Um, so you need to probably change your attitude, your paradigm, before you'll ever be happy. Uh, but we, we tend to, we tend to, to, to blame other circumstances from us being happy, richer, whatever it might be, smarter. Uh, we say, I would be if. And that is basically saying, I'm dependent on somebody else or something else to be successful. And so if you say that, I would be happy, I'd be more successful, I'd be whatever if, that's the first problem. Uh, unless you're saying if. I would be more proactive, uh, then maybe that's the right, the right thing to say. Um, but if you're blaming on somebody else or some circumstance, you're probably not going to be happy. Um, so we, as we achieve the private victory, we move from being dependent to independent. Now we are control of, we have achieved the private victory. We 
control our lives and our destiny to a large degree. But he's saying that is not the greatest success. For you to be successful, you have to achieve interdependence. Uh, you cannot be fully successful unless you know how to work with other people, uh, be with other people, be happy with other people. You're not happy and successful all by yourself. Uh, so whether it's your employees, whether it's your family, whether it's your parents, whether it's your teachers, whether it's your uh, friends, um, is that you have to, you will achieve more if you know how to be a good friend, to be a good husband, be a good manager, be a, a good person and know how to work with other people. And so we need to move from being independent, you know, I'm self-made man, to being interdependent where we can accomplish more together. Uh, so the very first thing he says is in recognizing the value of everybody, that is not this attitude that I'm going to figure out how to manipulate you so I can be more successful. I'm going to steal your company from you. I'm going to whatever. Uh, he says you can base that success on win-win. Uh, let's figure out how we can both win. That's the starting start of a wonderful negotiation. I don't want, in fact, he tells, when we get to that, he'll say, I don't want to win at your expense. I want us both to win. Um, and so he goes through win-win strategies of how uh, you can actually uh, win together. It does re relate a little bit. All of these top three are kind of intermeshed because in order to win-win, you need to understand what the other side wants, for example. Again, whether it's a business negotiation, it's a uh, relationship with your spouse, whatever it is, you need to understand them, even with your children. Um, so one of the, uh, you know, I don't want to be, I want to take away my instructions for that week, but I, I guess I will uh, a little bit, is that uh, um, he, uh, you may find me reiterating it in a few weeks, but um, if, if you're, child comes to you when you have a child he's now a teenager and he says i want to drop out of school i'm not happy i want to quit school uh, the first tendency uh, probably especially for asians but for caucasians in america too is are you crazy you can't be successful you drop out of school what are you thinking now get your clothes on and get to school now more or less some sort of response kind of like that um, he's suggesting a better way is, yeah, let's sit down and talk about it. What's going on? Why, why aren't you happy? Um, and you hear why they're not happy and well, you know, let's, what, what's your alternative? You know, so you start asking questions to understand better. What do you think you can do to be happy? Um, well that, you know, so I, I want to go be a mechanic at the local garage. Okay, well, mechanics can make pretty good living and stuff, but you, you need some education for that too. Um, will you, what is your plan so that you can make enough money so that you can have a family, you know, get married and have a family and, and uh, a home and stuff like that? How are you going to get there? Um, and so you, by asking questions, you and understanding more of what they, what the, what's going on, also what's going on at school, why they're not happy there. But what he finds is that ultimately, when you've listened long enough, uh, first off, they've thought it through a little better. They, they understand a little better what the obstacles are of dropping out of school. And usually after you've let them talk long enough, they will say, what do you think, Dad? What do you think I should do? Because now they feel understood. Once they feel understood, now, they're ready to listen to you. Um, so far, you just ask questions. And now you can give them some ideas. But now you, also you understand where they're coming from. You understand why they're not happy. So you're able to share some ideas. They're ready to listen and you're ready to give. And if we didn't listen, you wouldn't have been really ready to give because you would not have understood. And so it, it, does, it allows people to be understood and to really communicate better uh, because now both, you know, both feel understood, both 
uh, feel free to communicate, that they won't be condemned for, for communicating. So anyway, uh, so that's the same thing at win-win. If you're negotiating with somebody, first thing you need to do is establish, I want us both to be happy here. Let me, let me understand what you need to feel, to be, feel good about this. And then you go from there. Uh, once they, once, if you're, even if it's a very tense negotiations, if they feel understood, now they're willing to understand where you're coming from, what you need to be happy um, with the with the relationship. Again, that would be negotiation. It could be a marriage. It could be lots of things. Uh, synergize, another word that some of you may not be familiar with, another word that was invented before Stephen Covey, but became a popular part of Western culture uh, once once he did write his book. What synergy? I may have talked about that the other day. I don't know. Did I talk about that already? I don't know. Okay. Well, what is? Anybody know what synergy is? One of the definitions is synergy is when the whole is greater than the parts. Um, how can that be? So one plus one equals three. It happens all the time. You're here. I know one plus one equals three because you're here. Your parents made you. <laughs> so something happened when one plus one equals three. That's a type of synergy. Um, but there's other types of synergy besides the ob that obvious one, um, where, again, the whole is greater than the sum. Uh, it can be seen in something as easy as a, a bundle of sticks. You know, if you get a you get a, bu a bunch of branches from a tree, you can break them individually very easily. Um, but as you bind them together and try to break them, you can't break them anymore. And in fact, the energy it take to break that 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 uh, binding of limbs is greater than the sum of the energy it took to break each one. Um, in fact, like I said, it's probably impossible to break it. No matter how much energy you put into it, you probably can't break them once you get a certain number of limbs to, uh, put together. Um, but more importantly, probably the best example for our purposes is brainstorming. And is one reason why it links so perfectly with win-win and with uh, seek first to understand. Brainstorming requires people, you all know what brainstorming is, right? You've heard that before? Basically, where you get a group of people and you start, say you wanted to solve a problem, you start throwing ideas back and forth, brainstorm. Uh, so one of the first rules about brainstorming is that you can't criticize other people's ideas. You can maybe add to them, but at least in, in, through the initial uh, part of brainstorming, you can't say, that's too bad, <laughs> uh, because that kills the brainstorm. So you have to be open to listening to everybody's ideas. In other words, everybody needs to be understood. Everybody needs to have the, the opportunity to explain what they, how they think they could solve a problem, that particular problem. Uh, and then you start, uh, there's different strategies of how to do it, but then you start uh, maybe start doing the synergy is how to combine ideas. And so you say, you know, I really like Joe's idea uh, but what if we did it this way? We could make it even better if we did this. And somebody will say, yeah, yeah, you could. And then we could get these people to help out and we could do that. And somebody else gets excited and we can do that. And that's, uh, so basically the synergy comes when you come up with ideas that if you had everybody sit down there and write on a piece of paper all their best ideas, they would never have gotten to that best, that best of best ideas that you could accomplish brainstorming with each other because you start feeding off each other and you start um, you know, adding one idea to another idea and you create something greater than any one of you uh, had to begin with. So synergy is important and it relates very much, as I said, to those other things, uh, to the other ideas within in achieving interdependence. How do we as a group succeed? We listen to each other. We look for win-win situations. We synergize, we brainstorm and synergize and combine our ideas and create something really exciting. And that's usually how you feel when you've done a successful brainstorm. Um, many years ago, uh, I was elected to city council of the city where I was at. 
and and I've been watching city council for a number of years as a journalist, but I just, uh, and as a journalist, I couldn't run for city council, but I then had gone from journalism into marketing. So now I could uh, be, become a city council. I ran for city council and, uh, and I told them as soon as I was elected, there was about a month between, or like six weeks between the election and when I actually took office. But I told them right from the start, I think it's, you know, there's been so many problems in, in city council, so many disagreements, so much anger and frustration expressed. I think it's really important that we take some time in January, as soon as that's when I'd be sworn in was the start of January, that we take some time in January if possible and go someplace by ourselves and brainstorm what we want to accomplish together. And so we did that. And we used the strategies that uh, I've been describing. Uh, we made up a list of 96 things, I think it was, that we would like to accomplish. And then we prioritized them. Uh, and so there was a point where you know, after we'd listened to each other, we agreed what was most important and next to most important. And we didn't always agree. We didn't all agree in the, the way they were ordered, but we were all part of it. Arguments stopped. The frustration stopped. Everybody felt like they had been understood. Everybody, we had our list that we were going to work on, and we, even though maybe they put at the top something that that we didn't think was the most important, they, you know, we had an influence on it. And uh, that list, uh, I was only in city council for four years, but that list was still being worked on more than ten years later, because they were, it was, we had provided a vision for the whole city that that took a lot longer than four years to accomplish. Um, and they did it peacefully. Uh, that was the most, I think that's the most important thing I accomplished was to set a, a whole different attitude. Um, and, and then as if that weren't enough, they sent me, there was another organization, a different, it's actually a different governing body called the Library Dis District that builds libraries and, you know, pays, you know, buys the books and everything. And it was a different segment of government that just did that. That's all it was responsible for was, was libraries and uh, the city had been fighting with the library district uh, because the city was not part of the library district was not taxed directly by the library district and so they had to agree on how much money the the city should pay them every year for their services and uh, they couldn't agree on that they were yelling that the city you know got angry and they were going to start their own library and the library is mad at them so they sent me to be the liaison. And the first day I went to the library meeting uh, of their board of directors or board of trustees, whatever they call it, they made me sit outside the meeting room. In fact, I sat, out, I sat outside the meeting room for, I think for, might've been a couple of months before they trusted me. As I started talking to them about what's going on here. Well, what are your goals? What is it we don't, in other words, I was going with the first, seek first understand. And so ultimately, I proposed that two things. Uh, the main one was if the, if the city council is angry about in their negotiations with, you know, funding you financially, how about we make, we absorb the city into the library district so that the people in the, in the city are taxed directly by you and the city council doesn't even have anything to do with it. Um, and then I went and convinced the city that was made sense. We wouldn't have to worry about it anymore. It'd be up to, it'd be a direct relationship between the library district and the citizens of the city, but it would leave the city government out of it. And so I was told, oh, they're not going to do that. It's not going to be successful. But by the fact that we had the city endorsing it and the library in, endorsing it, uh, I was told that would not be passed the first time, but it was passed the first time. No problem. The second thing I said, you need a new library, right? You want a new library. Well, now that you, you know, now that you are, actually I did at the same time. So if we can get uh, the city absorbed into the library district, then we could probably, then we could recommend here in our city still another new large library. And everybody said, ah, people won't pass that. That costs a lot of money. They're not going to pass the bonds for that. Uh, but with all that support, passed the first time, no problem. So many times in my life, I've seen this work in ways that everybody said, oh, that's not going to work. Yeah, it can't work. 
but you get people buying into it. You get them feel like they're part of it, and the enthusiasm and positivity increases, and, and it, it's amazing. Um, on the outside is the seventh habit. It says, sharpen the saw. Um, and let me go through. I see I'm behind on my slides. Let me go through a few slides here. Uh, we already talked about dependence, independence, interdependence. Here's a definition of it. It'll be uploaded to the website. But uh, the big thing is when you're dependent, you're saying, you need to make me happy, basically. That's what a baby is more or less saying when he cries, right? You make me happy. Make me happy, please. Okay, that's the baby. Uh, when you become independent, you say, I can do it. You know, I'm... My, you know, I'm my own boss. I'm I'm going to be successful by myself. But when you get to interdependence, it's we can do it, and we can accomplish better things. And so those are kind of again the continue the maturity continuum. This is a, a level of of maturity, truly, uh, starting from a baby when we are have to be dependent, but trying to grow out of that. And a lot of people don't ever grow out of dependency. Other people get up to independent, never grow out of independency, and you can be dependent in one area and, and uh, independent in another, interdependent in another. So it's not a perfect, you know, once you become independent, you're not necessarily independent in everything. You're in, independent in some things, maybe financially, not emotionally, for example. Um, so, um, okay, so uh, another important principle. I definitely want to cover here. Um, this relates to all of, well, let me put it this way. I, I mentioned earlier that Dr. Covey believes that we can be better and happier if we look at ourselves holistically. So physically, mentally, spiritually, um, that if if we make ourselves stronger and better people in all those ways, that's important to being happy. Um, and so um, all of these principles we looked at can relate to all of those. Now, in that sense, um, he also then thinks we, uh, with that seventh habit around the outside, uh, sharpen the saw basically refers to keeping, you know, not, not ignoring uh, what what makes you successful? What makes you happy? Not in not ignoring the need to be physically strong, mentally strong, spiritually strong. That if you ignore those things, you will start falling backwards again. You have to keep yourself sharp, so to speak. And so uh, he he talks about this. This was a um, a uh, what would you call it? Anyway, a story of very from ancient times actually. Uh, called the uh, the goose that laid the golden eggs. Uh, anybody hear that story before? It doesn't seem to have pre uh, permeated the, the East. But in the West, it's quite famous. Um, anyway, the story is basically there was a farmer, and uh, he was poor, and he was unhappy. And every day he prayed for help. Uh, you know, God help me. And every day he... You know, not much happened, and he was miserable. And then one day, he went out, and uh, he uh, picked up his goose, and there beneath the goose was a golden egg, an egg of pure gold. He was so excited that now he could pay his bills. He, he, he had so many debts and so forth. Here, this golden egg would help him pay all of his bills. He would be he would finally be out of debt for the first time in decades. He was just so happy. And uh, so he did that. He paid off all of his bills. And now he owned his farm and his house and, and uh, didn't have uh, that burden to worry about the bank taking it away from him or anything. Um, and anyway, so he went to bed happy. Got up the next morning, picked up the goose, another going to hang. Now he was rich. Now, not only did he, now he could buy a bigger farm. He could make his house better. He could do all sorts of stuff now that he couldn't do before. And so this went on for several, you know, for quite a while until he was extremely rich and happy. But then there was something he wanted. And 
I don't even remember what the story, what it was in the story, but it, let's say he wanted to build, he wanted to uh, build himself a castle. I don't think that's the story, but anyway, he wanted something and he didn't have enough money for that. And so in his lack of wisdom, he decided to kill the goose and get all the eggs out at once. So he'd have all the eggs that were inside the goose. Well, what do you suppose? How many eggs do you think he found in the goose? Uh, none. Uh, that's not how geese make eggs. So he, he already had the egg that the goose laid that day and there was nothing else inside the goose. And so, you know, making a fool of himself, uh, you know, his life then was miserable again. Um, so how does that relate to what we're talking about? Uh, he, he calls it, uh, it's important to understand the PPC principle. Uh, how many are in business, are studying business? How many of you in the business field? No, nobody here? Okay, okay. Anyway, um, PPC is something you will study in business if you haven't already. It's production and production cap uh, capacity or capability. Um, and it's important because, uh, well, one of the stories he tells, I'll, I'll tell here, is that this guy was a manager of, uh, was a manager in this uh, plant and they had some big equipment uh, that they used to manufacture their, their stuff. He comes in and he says, I am going to be the most respected manager. I am, everybody's gonna praise my name. I'm going to hire more people. We are going to work day and night and we're going to outproduce anybody that's ever had this job. And so he hires some more people and he keeps his machines running all the time, all day, day and night, day and night. And he gets, he finally won all those honors and he become, he, they give him a, a raise and they promote him. Um, and then another guy comes in to take over his position and all the equipment breaks down. Uh, because he hasn't been taking care of the equipment. So how would you feel <laughs> if you're the guy that followed him? And in fact, how will his boss feel once he understands what happened? Um, now all this glory that he's won, now his boss realized you're an idiot. <laughs> you have destroyed our equipment. We had to buy new equipment. We're going to be down for the next two months as we install new equipment. You are a darn fool. Get out of here. Whatever. That's my scenario. But uh, the point is, is that you have to take care of your equipment if you uh, are in that sort of a business. Uh, they have, uh, I think it's someplace else, one, one of the, um, I think every American. In America, we love having a house and a yard. And in most parts of the country, it's a yard with grass, really nice grass. We know how to grow grass much nicer than they have here. Uh, so it's a really thick lawn. You can lay on it. feels like you're on a, laying on a rug. It's beautiful um, and wonderful. And when you have kids and stuff out playing in the backyard and stuff, this is the ideal for an American. Um, so, but we have to cut the grass. And so we buy... Uh, here they use what we call a weed whacker to cut all the grass here. But if it's nice and thick and so forth, it makes more sense to buy a lawn mower. Um, and, uh, and so we do. Um, and uh, in fact, that reminds me, I have to teach my stepson, who's never seen a lawn mower before, how to, he's back in the United States going to college and the grass is starting to grow and he doesn't know how to use the lawn mower because he's from Kazakhstan. Um, but anyway, uh, what I think almost everybody in America, except people that really love mechanics, we buy a lawnmower and we just mow and mow and mow and we do exactly what the guy in the story did. We mow until that lawnmower breaks down. We don't check the oil often enough. We don't uh, take out, oh, you know, in the, in, the, in the winter sometimes the gas goes bad. So in the summer, you should take out the gas and put in new gas. We don't do that. We don't get around to changing the spark plug. We don't check the wires. And so at some point, and we don't, we don't ever sharpen the blades. The blade, in the lawnmower, there's some blades that whirl around really, really fast to cut the grass. 
and to keep it going really good, you should also stop once in a while and sharpen the blades in the lawnmower. We don't do any of that stuff until our lawnmower doesn't work anymore. And luckily, it only costs maybe $150. So once every maybe four years, we throw away a lawnmower and buy a new one. It's really kind of stupid, but that so many people in America do that. Um, we don't take care of our lawnmowers. Um, so it's kind of the same thing. It's the same principle, yeah, reduced to the family setting. Uh, in America, we are always, every few years, we replace a lot more because we did not take care of it. We just waste another $150 for no good reason because uh, we were lazy, busy, whatever it was. Okay, so uh, real quick then, um, there are different types of assets also. You look at them as assets your physical asset, your financial asset, uh, your human asset. When we're talking about phys physical assets, your, obviously your health. Um, but also here's the picture of the lawnmower. Physical is not just your health. Physical is also, in fact, that, that is probably maybe included in the uh, human. So in this case, it's physical assets like your home. In America, we build wood homes frequently. Uh, if you don't paint a wood home, your wood starts deteriorating. And a lot of people, you see a lot of really crummy homes after a couple of decades, especially because nobody got around to painting the house. And the paint is what preserves wood from rotting. Um, the, uh, the lawnmower is the other example. A lot of things that we have that we don't take care of, you know, we need to take care of them if we want them to work for us. Uh, financially, um, the most important financial asset is our ability to earn money. But that's not the only one, uh, to be wise about our money. The, uh, we will study later in the uh, semester the teachings of uh, Robert Kiyosaki, who is a, a real estate investor. And he said, basically, and he's made a fortune investing in real estate. Um, and he wrote a, book, a famous book called Rich, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. His dad was uh, the head of the entire school system in the state of Hawaii. Very smart, PhD, very smart person. But um, what Kiyosaki says, yeah, but he bought into the idea that you're going to be happy and wealthy if you just get a college education and just do your job. He says he's going to die poor. I mean, in essence, not real poor, probably, but he basically all he's going to own is his house. He's going to leave his house to people, to his family, and that's it. Um, so he learned principles of investing in real estate, so he owned lots of real estate that paid for themselves, and then, you know, without before too long, he was a millionaire, and he learned that from his friend's dad. So his friend's dad was the rich dad. His dad, with his PhD, was the poor dad. Um, so that's, he, he talks about how to use your money wisely. And real estate is, a, is one of the better ways to do it, um, because it hardly, if you have a depression, you have value will come down, but real estate never, the value of real estate never disappears. Well, hardly ever. I guess never is a long time. But real estate is a good good investment, but it's not the only investment. So, you know, your assets, what do I, you know, your ability to earn money, certainly. That's why you're here getting an education. You want greater ability to earn money. Um, but once you start getting money, now what do you do with it? Someday you might not be able to earn money. Uh, in fact, almost certainly someday you won't. So how do you prepare for that day? And that day may be sooner than you think. Uh, so you don't know when it will be. Uh, in America, there's a disease, uh, in a sense, uh, that we call keeping up with the Joneses. And that is keeping up with the Joneses means you want to have as nice a house as the Joneses, as the other family, the Jones family. You want to have a nicer car as the Jones family and so forth. Uh, my son, my oldest son is, I think, 42. He does not own a home still, uh, but he has lots of fun in life. Fun. Uh, that's, and sadly, his wife is a wonderful person, actually makes twice as much money as he does, and he has a decent job. Together, they make uh, over $100,000 a year, and they're still paying rent because they spend their money on going to ball games and doing stuff all the time, going to Disneyland, going, you know, every year they take multiple trips to go have fun. 
they've never bought a house um, and, and, and other things that could be valuable to them. So very frustrating to me uh, because I, I don't believe in debt. I want to stay, you know, I believe in being careful of my financial assets. Um, human assets, um, certainly uh, your health is the most important part of a human asset, staying healthy, exercising, uh, doing all the stuff you, you, you can do. Um, and, and that's a PPC balance. Your, your body is a machine, in essence. And if you take care of it, then it can take care of you for a long, long time and help you be happy for a long, long time. If you don't take care of it, then yeah, um, then that's another problem, right? So um, yeah, take care of your body. So that's as I said, uh, it just so happened that Dr. Covey was out riding his bike trying to keep care of his body when he got run over and killed. But I don't think that's a good reason not to do your exercise. Um, he was. I, don't know. I think he was getting pulling. He was getting close to 80 years old when he was killed, so he lived a very good life. There's also organizational PC. Um, if you go back to the example I gave uh, of meeting with your employees every so often and seeing how you can help them be more successful, how you, how you can help them, that's your that's part of your organizational PC. Uh, you may want them to work all the time. But if you don't care about their progress and their happiness, they're, like I said, people don't quit jobs, they quit bosses. And you're gonna be one of the bosses they quit. Um, and so, you know, working on your organizational PC, if, if they, if you perhaps uh, uh, provide uh, some financing for them to take more, more uh, college classes, uh, you know, to keep up with uh, you know, their lifelong learning, they will be able to do more for you. Uh, so you know, there are some uh, companies in America now that bring, um, one of the favorite things is to bring uh, professors in and they are, they are establishing their, their kind of their own in-house MBA program. And so as many of their employees as want to basically can earn an MBA because they bring the professors to them and uh, teach the classes right there in their, in their offices, uh, in their building. Um, I know Korea is really big into lifelong learning. They have created many cyber universities. I was uh, uh, the president of KIMAP University in Kazakhstan is Korean. He, his, most of his career was in America, so he may have dual citizenship, I'm not sure. But um, he uh, uh, still loved his country and he, he, he still felt like the universities in uh, Korea were some of the best, and he was very excited about the idea of cyber universities. And I was a distance learning uh, coordinator at at the you know at our university, so he had me meet quite a bit with uh, the Korean cyber university officials and understand how they were doing it and the strategy behind it. But it's definitely just, you know, if Korea is going to be uh, and Clay Christensen Christensen says that basically they're the the next big thing in innovation. That is, it's past the United States unless we import people to help us keep going, which is what we're doing. And what we need to do is is allow lots of, oops, uh, well, we're about done anyway. Uh, I'm not sure why it turned off, but anyway. Um, so America has a little bit of an advantage that it can, it can allow immigration to keep them on the cutting edge, so to speak. But their own people, they don't want to take, uh, Techn they don't want to study technology and mathematics and science. Um, they don't want to study that stuff. They want to study liberal arts. And that's exactly what happened to Japan. They had, a, they had a one generation that was really into engineering and so forth. Uh, and now their children want to take liberal arts. And so now it's Korea, who has a generation of people who really want to know engineering and science and so forth. And they're, they're the ones on the rise. And Dr. Covey suggests that maybe it's China coming up right behind them. And that at some point, the next generation will come along to Korea and the next generation will want to take liberal arts in university. Um, and so then another country, China or somebody will be the one moving to the top. So uh, um, let me see if I can get this. There is this one last thing I did want to 
show you. So let me see if I can get that back on again. Well, it's going to be on the video. But I don't know. Somehow we got cut off from the projector. Let me see one more time, see if I can get it up. There we go. Okay, well, um, so um, this is these are the, the uh, videos you're to watch this week. There's quite a few, but they're all, almost all short. So you see starting at the top, that one is a little bit longer, and that is about Asia Rising. That is, uh, you were supposed to watch a Hans Rosling video week one, and that was about how the whole world is getting better, getting healthier, everything's, that if you don't just think about today, if you see the progress of it happening in the world, it's a very positive thing. And so his first uh, video that you should have watched week one was very positive, very uplifting. Um, this one is about the future of Asia and how it will be dominating the world economy. Um, and so that's a good one. Uh, the next one's only three minutes long, kind of supports the first one. Um, others are kind of a little bit um, kind of positive thinking oriented. And they're all very short. So Tony Robbins, eight minutes. Trace, uh, Brian Tracy, two minutes. Zig Ziglar, 10 minutes. Uh, Tom Hopkins, um, talking about sales. We're all salesmen, by the way, so you should listen to it from that perspective, but other things too. But that is basically saying, you know, your enthusiasm is what's going to sell you. A little bit of a superficial philosophy, but it's not to say it's not true, but it should be the real you. It shouldn't just be a tactic to influence other people. Uh, Jack Canfield, uh, again, working, uh, creating your attitude. Um, and the last one, uh, thank God I got fired. Um, so add them all up. It's uh, 5, 7, 17, 25, 28, uh, 20, 34, 44 minutes, all of them. So less than an hour. Um, so please watch those, and uh, uh, you'll need to watch those in order to uh, ace your quiz, uh, along with what I've taught today. Um, by the way, again, I... While I don't mind seeing your eyes pointed at me, again, it, you'll facilitate your work if you take notes while I'm lecturing, uh, because then you have stuff to, uh, mod, you know, you have something to base your um, uh, your journal entry on, and some of the stuff that I'm talking about could help you with your quiz as well, um, because yeah, it will. So um, I suggest you'll help yourselves out if you take notes. Um, I was always a big note taker. It certainly helped me with, with when I was at the university. So. Any questions, any problems, anything else? We're out of time. Okay. Well, uh, I'll be up here if anybody has any questions. Uh, thank you. And we will see you next week.